this is lab 1516 and it is a series of short little experiments on the sensory system uh, the first part will be from fox 3.4 uh, the cutaneous sensations and then we'll look at fox 3.5 and the supplement uh, and uh, look at visual uh, things so i think this one's best looking at the experiment and talking about the discussion with each one uh, making sure we just completely finish one before we move on to the next one as opposed to talking about it and then going back and doing it again this gets less confusing there's there's eight experiments and it'll make a lot more sense doing it that way i think so the first one which is 3.4a of fox is mapping touch receptors uh, what we're looking at is we're looking at the distribution of uh, receptors within the skin. Okay? Sometimes they're called cutaneous or general sensations. And we're looking to see if they're the same or different receptors and uh, what we uh, can feel for each one. So what you basically do is you put a test grid on someone's arm. So literally, I would just take the forearm and put a four by four grid that works pretty well on the arm with washable ink. And then you take a probe and you gently touch each spot and ask the person if they feel the touch. And typically, nearly everybody feels touch everywhere. Then you take a cold probe and do the same thing. So you have a cold probe, you have a probe sitting in ice, basically. And then you do the same thing, but this time the question for the cold probe is, do you feel it cold? And that's what you're looking at for the cold probe. And then you do the same thing for the warm probe. So it's a probe that's sitting in warm water. And this time the question is, do you feel it warm? And what happens is you get distributions that often look like this, where they have some cold cluster together, but there's a lot of absence of cold. And the same thing for, for warm. And so there's a couple things to really notice here. Uh, we feel touch everywhere. We feel cold in some spots. We feel warm in some spots. But they don't overlap, meaning they're not always exactly the same. So that tells us that touch receptors, cold receptors, and warm receptors are distinctly different receptors. Right? And then the density of each receptor, right? varies in terms of where it's at and what it's doing but every time we have a receptor we have to make sure it has the neuronal equipment to be able to be relayed to the central nervous system and then the central nervous system needs to have a place to relay it to the uh, brain and the brain needs to have an area for that interpretation and so we have touch receptors everywhere because we need discrete localization of touch. Uh, if there's a you know bug on you that might be dangerous or something, um, you need to know exactly where it is to take care of it. But typically, when we look at cold or warm environments, it's not localized just to you know one part of our forearm. It's cold everywhere typically, and so we don't need to have as many cold receptors or warm receptors as we do touch because we don't need discrete localization of cold or warm we need to know oh yeah it's cold or it's warm but we just don't need that discrete localization so what this does is it saves space in our central nervous system so we don't have to have uh, neurons or tracks or anything or areas of the brain the brain's already big enough for interpretation of those so the density varies for each one, and touch has a much greater density, and that's because we need discrete localization of touch. That's kind of the take-home lesson for 3.4a. 3.4b is a two-point discrimination threshold, and the purpose is to uh, look at the uh, density of touch receptors at different parts of the body. And so what we do is we take what's called an anesthesiometer. And, uh, you know, this is a, a one that you have a series of these, and these pins are um, 
a certain distance apart and then you use a different one each time. Uh, the stesiometers we have in class look like this. I think we have a picture back here. Looks sort of like this where it's like a caliper with little needles on it. Um, they're not really sharp and you can adjust the width of the needles on that piece of equipment. So what we like to do is we like to measure it three times and then sort of get the average of what we call the two-point discrimination threshold. And what you do is you start with the esthesiometer far apart and you bring it closer and closer together. And so when you initially start, you want to make sure the two pins are far enough apart so the person feels two distinct uh, uh, sensations. And then you bring it closer and closer together until the person feels only one distinct sensation. So you want to see at the point where it goes from two to one, and that's called the two-point discrimination threshold. Uh, it's best to do it a couple times to uh, get an average of the measurement. Sometimes you get in a, a weird spot on, on a certain part of the body and uh, you, know, you get some weird answer. So basically you do it three times and you, you know, take the average. And if there's one really weird, you sort of ignore it. Try it again. And you need to do um, four different parts. Now, the four parts we're going to do are the fingertip, the palm of the hand, the back of the hand, and the back of the neck. Um, one of the more interesting areas to me is actually the back of the calf. The problem with the back of the calf is that it's not always accessible easily in lab. Um, but uh, usually the fingertip, palm of the hand, back of the hand and back of the neck are. So we use those in lab. And basically what we end up seeing is data much like this. So, you know, most people find the fingertip, you know, just a couple of millimeters and the palm of the hand is, you know, two or three times as far. And then the back of the hand is farther than that. Back of necks, you know, even farther than that. It's still not that far, but 19 millimeters is, you know, over three quarters of an inch. So we're getting, you know, pretty, pretty big distance between that. Uh, and here's some, um, you know, typical data that you would see. We don't do all of these, but, you know, I find the cap really interesting because it's like 48, you know, to 60 millimeter, right? So you're talking, you know, two or three inches for people. And, uh, you know, it's, kind of a good point to make when we, we look at this. Um, what we're really looking at is the size and density of the receptor field. Okay. And really, you know, it gets down to how good of what we call discrimination do you need? Um, you know, your fingers have a very close discrimination, uh, not on this list, but uh, your tongue and lips actually have a very low two-point discrimination threshold as well. But certainly, you know, it's not very practic practical to do that in the laboratory. Um, so uh, what we're looking at is the smaller receptive fields um, uh, tend to uh, be a little different in the way they behave. Um, and it really depends on uh, what the density is. And so you could have one of um, four situations. You could have these very small receptors without a whole lot of density. Um, that's actually very similar to what the cold and warm receptors are that we just talked about in the first experiment. So they're not really dense and they're kind of diffusely located and they're not really large. Um, or you could have small receptors that are densely packed together and that's like your fingertip, or you could have large receptors that are diffuse apart, and there's not very many of those in the body. I can't think of one off the top of my head. Uh, or you could have these very large receptive fields that are fairly densely packed, um, like the calf or the upper arm. So the numbers you see down at the bottom of this list are large receptive fields that are densely packed because they're touch receptors. And here at the bottom of the list are very small receptive fields that are densely packed. Um, and, that, and that's pretty true for touch receptors because we saw in the other experiment that touch receptors, pretty much wherever we touched on the, the part of the experiment we looked at, uh, the forearm, which isn't 
a huge um, uh, a huge sensitive area, we see that the data uh, does not um, does not reflect the fact that these these receptors are far apart. They're, they tend to be you know densely packed. So in areas where we have the highest density and the smallest receptors, we're going to have the best two-point discrimination. So the areas we looked at, the finger, right, has the small receptors that are very densely packed. And the reason why we know that is in order to feel two-point discrimination, you have to excite at least two different receptors. So if you're on the same receptor, your body can't determine that difference between them because you you know signal action potentials along the same neuron and there's no difference and so you need to excite at least two two receptive fields in order to to, to feel uh, the the two different prongs so this has the small densely packed receptive receptive field the finger and then the palm of the hand back of the hand right follow the order that we're talking about. And the back of the neck tends to be, of the ones we tested, the uh, largest receptive field. Uh, but still, because they're touch receptors, they're densely packed. So that was kind of the take-home lesson for that one. C is an interesting one, and it has to do with adaptation of temperature receptors. And it brings up some very interesting uh, uh, data and, and some ideas that we don't have a chance to talk about often. So I like this experiment because it's it's kind of practical. Um, if you uh, take a student and uh, what we would do is we would have a ice bath, so very cold water, and then we'd have a, a warm water bath, and then in between them we'd have a room temperature water bath, meaning you know, we'd have these these different water baths, and you know they're big enough to put you know two hands in if you need to for each one. Just lay it out on the table. And so the first thing we want to do is we want to um, test about uh, how fast do temperature receptors adapt. And so what the person does is they put their one hand in the warm water and the other hand in the cold water, and let it sit for just a second, and then put both hands in room temperature water. And what they find is the cold water, the cold hand feels cold, and the warm water, the warm hand feels warm. And when you put them into the room temperature water, um, you know, you, you don't get any sensation. They, they feel the same, um, and it, nothing's different. Um, then you do the same experiment. It gets actually pretty difficult because the ice water is pretty cold. Uh, and you want to hold your hands in the water so the one hand in the cold water, the other hand in the warm water, and you want to do that for 60 seconds. So you want to do it for a full minute. And again, it hurts for the cold water. Um, and after leaving it for that time period, when you take the one that was in warm water and put it in the room temperature water, it now feels cold. And you take the one that was in the cold water and put it in room temperature water, it feels warm even though both hands are in the exact same temperature water. And so the first part of the experiment, where we didn't feel any difference after a second, but felt differences after a minute, tells us that receptors adapt at different rates. And in this case, the temperature receptors are slow adapting. So uh, we'll kind of look at it and talk in general about receptors that adapt. Um, first of all, there are some receptors that are rapidly adapting. Those tend to be touch and pressure receptors, among others. Uh, it means that when they first get stimulated, they fire very quickly, and then they adjust their firing rate if the stimulation stays constant. Those are called rapidly adapting receptors. And again, that's touch and pressure. And if you think about it, like you put clothes on, and you can feel your clothes. Well, if your touch receptors never adapted, you would be feeling your clothes all the time, right? And so it would be, you know, for most people, very irritating, if not impossible, literally to wear clothes because you'd always be um, uh, stimulating these, these touch receptors that would just constantly bombard your brain with um, uh, different signals uh, to say, hey, you're, you're wearing clothes. And it just, 
uh, just couldn't do it. So uh, rapidly adapting receptors, good examples of that are touch and pressure. There are also slow adapting receptors, and those are like temperature or proprioceptors. So your proprioceptors are your receptors that look at joint angle or position in space or um, muscle tension or things like that. So uh, the reason why we have to keep our hands in the hot and cold water for a minute or the warm and cold water for the minute is the temperature receptors are slowly adapting. So within the one second, they haven't done anything yet. So we have to leave them in longer to get them to adapt to the temperature. And then when we put them both in the room temperature water because now they're adapted, uh, they feel different. Um, you might have uh, felt that way getting in a shower or, or maybe getting in a jacuzzi or a hot tub. Sometimes when you get into a hot tub, they might be 103, 104, 105 degrees. And, you know, when you when you first try to get in, you put your you know big toe in and then your foot and then your leg. And it takes you a while to slide in. And after you're in and for a couple minutes, your uh, Temperature receptors are, have adapted to the new temperature, and you really don't feel nearly as, as hot or warm as you did when you first got in, and that's that slow adapting temperature receptor. If it adapted faster, then you would not feel that difference as, as quickly. Um, there are also some receptors that never adapt, and those are your pain receptors, what we call nociceptors. Uh, a nociceptor is a receptor that basically senses uh, something that might cause tissue damage. And that is what we interpret as pain within our, our brain. Uh, so those are called non-adapting receptors, and they never adapt. So the first part of the experiment was to look at adaptation rates for receptors. Second part is that receptors respond to changes in temperature, not absolute temperature. And that's uh, a, a key component of receptors as well. So um, you know, as an example, if it was, you know, 80 degrees out and you jumped into a, you know, 60 degree pool, right? The temperature difference is 20 degrees and it would feel really cold. Well, you probably do this as a kid where you went into a hot tub that again might be, you know, 105 degrees, got used to it and then jumped in a heated swimming pool. That's 85 degrees, but it still feels freezing when you do it. And that's because you went from 105 to 85, a 20 degree drop, felt just as cold as going from, you know, 80 to 60. Uh, so it's that change in temperature that matters, not the absolute temperature. So that's what temperature receptors do is they don't tell us, oh, the temperature is, you know, 60 degrees or 80 degrees. It, they tell us that the temperature is lower or the temperature is higher than it was. So that was kind of the key for temperature receptors and, and doing that experiment. Uh, you can do it at home. Uh, just, you know, don't make the warm water too uh, hot so that it doesn't cause any pain. And for the room temperature water, just let it sit for a while. And, you know, you kind of feel those differences. Kind of cool. Um, the last one you've probably done, but not on purpose, and that's referred pain. So referred pain is to demonstrate pain felt that's not arising from the origin. Okay, so it's some way, somewhere different than the production site. And the idea for uh, referred pain for us was we would take a reflex hammer, right? So one of those medical hammers that has that little triangular you know, rubber head. And you would take your arm and, and uh, hold it up and, and you know, make like a, a, a very short angle. Uh, so you're going to flex your arm. And then you can take the reflex hammer and try to hit the ulnar nerve with it, right? So if you go out and you feel on your elbow, you know, you can feel what the, the medial epicondyle and you can feel the olecranon process. And right in there, you should be able to find the little ulnar notch, and that's where the ulnar nerve runs. And so then you take the reflex hammer and you hit it, and it's like hitting your funny bone. That's what we call hitting your funny bone, right? But if you do it, then what ends up happening is that nerve might tingle a little bit, but most people feel the sensation up in the palm of their hand or um, in their wrist. And so even though you're striking the reflex hammer, 
at the elbow, your pain sensation is actually up in your hand. And so that's called referred pain. Uh, referred pain is important for a bunch of reasons uh, and medically has certain uh, things that really become imperative in terms of recognizing uh, you know, potential symptoms of impending heart attack or something like that. Uh, but even in something as simple as brain freeze, right? So if you go to 7-Eleven and get a Slurpee or, you know, drink a, a you know, I, you know, a daiquiri too fast or, you know, some sort of other iced drink or, you know, eat ice cream too fast, then you get what's called brain freeze. And what they found for brain freeze is that you stimulate uh, receptors in the roof of your mouth that end up having referred pain that makes it feel like you've got a headache, basically. And then, uh, you know, medically important one is what we call angina, right? So down here, angina. Um, angina is not pain from a heart attack necessarily, but it's usually a symptom of people not getting enough oxygen to their heart. And that often is a signal of an impending heart attack where they, um, even though the, the heart is not getting enough oxygen, it's the pain they feel in the arm or shoulder, or that's for men, or for women, it's the jaw, their arm, or their back, um, so like in their shoulder blade. So learning to be able to recognize angina certainly helps. And what's interesting is about half the people that seek medical assistance uh, because they think they're having a heart attack because they have chest pain aren't. Um, and they're having some other thing, you know, a panic, uh, disorder or um, uh, some sort of like uh, a digestive issue like acid reflux or something like that. So that's just as common. What's also common, unfortunately, is people do have mild heart attacks where they don't recognize they had a heart attack because they don't recognize the angina uh, that's in another part of the body because they think, well, if I had a heart attack, my chest should hurt, right? Um, so you can see it also for like um, gallbladder issues. Uh, oftentimes, gallbladder pain is referred to the back of the neck. So someone who has gallbladder gallbladder issue, like gallstones, it's causing problems um, in that area. Uh, their neck hurts, and that's especially true if um, they're eating a fatty food, which exacerbates that problem um, as well. Uh, so. That's referred pain, and, and you know, pain's really interesting. Uh, for those of you that get into especially the medical or dentistry field, you know, especially clinical medicine, then, you know, pain is something you have to deal with uh, a lot. And, you know, pain is what we call the conscious response to nociception. Remember, I mentioned nociceptors were receptors that, uh, signal there's tissue damage. So if you consciously interpret that, then you have what's called nociception. Um, you can consciously interpret pain when it's not there. Um, the mental influence to enhance or dull pain is, is very strong. Um, there are some people that can't feel pain, and you know they're born with that. It's called congenital analgesia. And uh, this guy Ronald Niederman uh, does lots of weird things where he can't feel pain. Um, which actually, you know, pain's an evolutionary response to tissue damage. So um, sometimes people who have like uh, diabetes or other uh, neurological disorders, what's called neuropathy. Um, so neuro referring to your nervous system and uh, opathy referring to uh, disease. When they have neuropathy, um, sometimes they lose uh, feeling and so there's a, a famous film of a woman making breakfast for her kids and they're filming it for some other reason but her arm catches on fire literally and because she's got that neuropathy she can't feel any pain in her arm and uh the kids have to tell her to put her arm out because it's on fire and you know the thing is you just don't want to do that tissue damage um to that area so you know pain's kind of interesting and um you know sometimes uh you know it's not just, uh, uh, you know, in, induced functionally, but it also could be psychologically. And, you know, one of the things you have to you know, deal with as a clinician 
is if your patient feels pain, then you have to figure out why and try to fix it, uh, at least ethically, morally. So those are the cutaneous senses. We also have the visual sensations. Uh, this is in Fox 3.5a and um, supplement number one. We're going to look at the idea of acuity. Acuity is your visual acuity is your ability to resolve objects. And so one of the more famous ways to do that is what's called the Snellen eye chart. You've all seen it in California. It's uh, state law that you get your vision checked, I think, in like second grade and fifth grade or something. Um, so you've done these before. And basically, um, you know, when you look at that, you get some sort of vision. And your vision number is like 2015 or 2050 or 2200, whatever that number is. And so one of the things to remember about this chart is, I think most of you probably realize these numbers, you've heard them before. Um, is that since that first number is always 20, that's how far you're supposed to stand away. All right, so you stand from this chart 20 feet away, the chart is the standard size. And if you read the chart, right, theoretically some of the 2020 vision would be able to read this line very clearly uh, from 20 feet. And if you had worse than 2020 vision, you'd be somewhere higher up here. And if you had better than 20-20 vision, you'd be lower and down here. So let's say that somebody had 20-20 vision. It basically means you see from 20 feet what an average person sees at 20 feet. Well, what happens if you read this line down here? Well, they don't show it here, but the line down here is 2015. So if you're able to read that line from 20 feet, you'd have 2015 vision, which means you see at 20 feet what a normal person sees at 15 feet. So that means you can stand farther back than they can. And that says that your vision's better. All right. Most people, especially as you get older, go up the chart, unfortunately. And so, uh, for instance, you could have, you know, 2050 vision. That would be just reading these. And that means you see at 20 feet what a normal person sees at 50 feet. So you have to stand two and a half times closer to be able to resolve the objects the same. Uh, in California, it's state law from the DMV that you need 2040 vision or better uncorrected to drive without corrective lenses. And so if you go to the DMV office, they have those eye charts and uh, they'll test your eyes. And if you can't pass, they'll put a little stamp on your license that says you're supposed to wear corrective lenses. Um, the E is 2200, and that's a definition of being legally blind. Okay, so all that's the acuity that's called the Snell and Eye chart. Um, the other one's called the two line discrimination test, not to be confused with the two point discrimination test. Okay, and what happens is uh, we have a little card that has two lines on it, and the lines are one millimeter thick and one millimeter apart. And if you stand close enough, then you can look and see two separate lines. But then if you back away, and it's best to cover one eye, you cover one eye and you back away, eventually those two lines fuse into what looks like one line. And so you see one thicker solid line. And when you find that point where it goes from two to one you stop and you measure the distance away from the, the wall that it's posted on and that's um, how far you are from the wall okay and then you put it in this this formula um, d1 is the average length of the eyeball that's how far your light has to pass through to strike the retina d2 is the unknown width of two cones in the back of the retina retina. Remember, you have photoreceptors in your eye. You have rods and cones. And at the fovea centralis, that central area of your eye, that's where you have the best acuity. So we're measuring the distance between two cones. Okay. Uh, D3 is the distance from the wall. We'll measure that in millimeters to keep everything in the same units. All right. And most people are like, you know, 3,000 to 6,000 millimeters. So three to six meters away from the wall. Pretty far. And then 
the one millimeter distance between the lines is because we drew them that way, right? So then you uh, solve for the D2, the distance between um, two cones on the retina. And what, what it comes down to is if you do the algebra, you get um, 25 divided by the distance away from the wall, right? And then you get some really small number, like 0 0.007. And then you divide that number by 2 to get the distance between um, uh, two cones. So it works pretty well. It doesn't do a bad job for someone with normal vision estimating the width between two cones in their eye, to be honest. And you get something, you know, in the neighborhood of, you know, three to four micrometers apart. Uh, so it works pretty well. But it doesn't work very well, or at all, to be honest, with people with poor vision. So as an example, you know, partly because I'm old, but I have bad eyes. And so um, it, when I do these, this test in particular, uncorrected, I, I get like literally a foot away from the wall with my bad eye before I can't see the two lines anymore. And so when you measure that distance, it's 10 times closer than the average person at least. So when you do the math, my distance in my width of cones is 10 times bigger. And if you think, okay, the formula says the width of my cones is 10 times larger. And okay, is my you know, vision bad because my cones are 10 times farther apart than the average person? Or is it some other reason? Well, it's some other reason. And the vast majority of the time, it's probably true. It's some other reason. So for people with normal vision, it works okay. People with bad vision, it doesn't work very well at all. So that's how we measure acuity, and that's the two-line discrimination test in Fox uh, supplement number one for lab 1516, and then Fox 3.5a. The next one is called the astigmatism chart. And astigmatism means you have an imperfection in the field of view. And that prevents uh, light from passing through your eye equally. Meaning, you know, if, if you go back to your anatomy of your eye, and I'm not going to hold you responsible for the anatomy of the eye because you did that anatomy problem. But, you know, light passes through the cornea. That's the front part of your eye, right? And then the aqueous humor, then the lens, then the vitreous humor that makes up most of the posterior portion of the eyeball, and then strikes the retina. And if it doesn't go perfectly through those things, then it's not going to um, uh, be perfect in terms of your vision. And you can't do it really. Yeah, this chart doesn't work very well unless you got a bad astigmatism because, you, you know, maybe if you're so far away from it. But what happens is you're supposed to, you know, take off any corrective lenses you have, uh, cover one eye, and then look at the center. You're actually supposed to do this from 20 feet. Uh, just like the Snellen eye chart. And what happens is uh, one plane or sometimes two planes uh, become more bold. So it looks like, you know, one set of planes stands out or sometimes two. Like in my one eye, it's 8, 2, and 1, 7. In my other eye, it's 3, 9. So they're completely opposite. And they just are more bold. And the reason why they're more bold is this astigmatism I have where light passes through the eye. Uh, not perfectly, and it's not perfectly balanced when I when I see things. Um, if I wear my glasses, uh, my doctor who who you know gave me the prescription, he fixed that for me. So he has my lenses so that they fix that astigmatism, so I don't see it when I have my lenses on. Uh, if I take my glasses and turn it sideways, though. Um, I can and I can't see it here for the my my uh, better eye my bad eye I can because it's so uh, severe that I can I can look so if you look at your lenses through not the normal vision but 90 degrees you can actually see the astigmatism that is correcting for it so astigmatism just means that uh, it's imperfection in the field of view and it's much more likely that students have a uh, astigmatism than not. Uh, there are you know a couple of people that don't notice it, but most people in class have some degree of an astigmatism, um, and that's that's normal. 
if you have an astigmatism that's not really severe, they will um, not worry about it. And if you have corrective lenses, then they'll correct the astigmatism at the same time. But most people don't have uh, stigmatism severe enough to worry about um, until it gets really bad. And usually it's associated with um, uh, poor acuity where you need to wear glasses anyway. Um, some people, you know, the problem with astigmatism is your brain doesn't like that being blurry. And so as you look through the, the at something and it comes back blurry because you have an astigmatism because the light doesn't pass perfectly through your eye, what you need to compensate for that is your eyeball makes these little tiny, almost imperceptible movements to try to uh, basically lie to your brain and keep everything in focus. And so if you did a lot of studying or watching, you know, something on a screen, um, then your astigmatism could, you know, make your eyes tired and give you a headache. Uh, but generally speaking, we don't worry about it unless it's really severe uh, and don't correct it all by itself. You know, I have had students that literally had like 2012 vision or something in class, yet still had these, you know, fairly severe astigmatisms. It, it's, you know, one doesn't necessarily um, have to do with the other, but oftentimes people that do have acuity issues also have astigmatism issues. The last part um, is what's called accommodation. And uh, accommodation is how well does your eye focus on objects at different distances? And the ability of your eye to focus on objects at different distances has to do with a couple things. One, your lens. So as things get closer, right? So if you look down here at this, this picture is pretty easy to understand. This is your lens nice and fat. And as things get closer, your lens gets fat to focus things perfectly on your retina. In, if you're looking at something far away, right? Your lens gets flatter. Um, and that'll focus the light onto the back of your retina properly as well. Okay, so you have to change the length of your lens. And what really changes the length of your lens are your ciliary muscles. Okay, so those are muscles in your eye that move the lens. And so as you get older, your lens becomes less pliable, it's less flexible. And it's harder for your eye muscles to be able to move the lens. And when that happens, um, it's more difficult for you to see. And the first place you really see it is in something called presbyopia, which basically means old eye. And usually in the early 40s, their lens, people's lens gets uh, inflexible enough where it's difficult for them to read and it's difficult for them to focus, especially close up. And so when I was younger, um, I really never understood, like, you know, uh, remember we were going to the movies one time and, and my father-in-law was looking at the newspaper at the times. And, you know, in the old days, right, they, there was no internet and you wanted to know the movies, you looked in the newspaper, the newspaper said, oh, this movie starts at 7.10 or whatever. So uh, he was looking and he couldn't see it without his glasses and he held it farther away, which didn't make any sense to me. It's like, well, why would you hold it farther away? And it's because when, you know, his eye uh, couldn't focus at the close distance because he couldn't make his lens fat enough uh, to do that. And so, um, you know, it, it wasn't pliable enough. So what you do for this, for accommodation, is um, you take a pen tip or we use a wire screen in class because it's easy to see through. And you look through the wire screen, but focus across the classroom on the other side of the classroom. And so what you're doing is you're in your far away vision. And while you're in your, while you're in your far away vision, you're going to notice the wire screen. And then you're going to bring the wire screen closer to you. And here's the hard part. As you bring it closer to you, you're still focusing on the other side of the classroom with your far away vision. It doesn't work for a lot of students because the first thing they do is they focus on the wire screen. You can't. You have to look through the wire screen and focus on your faraway vision across the room or even outside if the window uh, shades are down. 
are up so you can you can see so as you focus far away and you bring the wire screen towards you eventually it comes out of focus and once it comes out of focus you stop and you measure that distance in centimeters from the eyeball and that's called your um, near point for accommodation and once once you get that number and there'll be you should get one for each eye um, you're going to look at it and say, okay, you're going to put it in this chart. And there's a couple of things to notice about this chart, um, but we'll figure out the near point first. So we'll make it easy. Let's say somebody's near point in class was 10 centimeters. So you go across here and you go, oh, 10 centimeters, this person has, see the age years, has a visual age of 20. Okay. Um, make it a little more difficult let's say they have a, a, a near point of 16. You're okay 16 well it's somewhere between 13 and 18 and it's closer to 18 so i would say 37 right you're just guessing at that point in time but you know 37 is probably a good point for the um, visual age then you're going to compare the visual age to the chronological age chronological age right here is how old are you? What does it say in your driver's license, right? And it it matters uh, for this reason. So uh, let's do one more, and let's say somebody had a uh, near point of accommodation of 25. So I come over here and I go, okay, 18 to 53. That's a pretty big spread, All right? So that's you know what 35 difference. So if they're at 25, that's seven up. That's like 42 years of age. So their chronological, uh, sorry, their visual age is 42. Well, if this person was 80 years old, what would you tell them? Hey, great, you got the eyes of someone who's half your age, right? So that matters. What happens if they were 20? Oh, that sucks. You got the eyes of someone who's twice your age. So the uh, visual age, right, depends on whether it's good, bad, or normal on the chronological age. Uh, when you look, right, the, the table, notice that from 9 to 10, right, so it's probably easier if we do the age first. So the visual age is 10 to 20, we go from 9 to 10 for near point. And from 20 to 30, we go up from 10 to 13, and from 30 to 40, we go 10 to 18. So we're going on these small jumps every decade. We go to 40 to 50, we jump from 18 to 53, right? So if it tripled, right, it would be 54. So this number almost triples here in this decade. So this is the decade where your eyes are probably going to get really bad. Um, and most people, if you talk to people over 40, will tell you my eyes are perfect until I got to, you know, my 40th birthday and then they got really bad. So um, be able to use this chart and figure out from a near point what the visual age is and then assess the visual age with the chronological age and we won't worry about the frog because we already we already looked at that lab so that's the um, sensory lab and again it's just eight little experiments that uh, hopefully you understand a lot better